Well, hi, this is Chris. Welcome back. The date today is April 30th, year of our Savior, 2016. April 30th, 2016. This is going to be Bible study number 44. Yes, Bible study number 44. And the title of this is Roman Catholicism. Yes, Roman Catholicism. So we're talking about Roman Catholicism is a mixture of um, paganism and Christianity. And so we talked about this concept, 1 Peter 5, 3. Uh, actually, there's two words that come from the word lords over God's heritage in your Greek. And one of them is kata, K-A-T-A. And K-A-T-A forms C-A-T-A, which equals C-A-T-H, which equals Catholic. So, kind of interesting. So, that's the saying you need a church. So, you see that these, this is a mediatory or a mediator, an intermediate system, Roman Catholicism. That's what they say. They say you need, you need the priest as the mediator between God and the people. So that's the saying, you need a church, and outside the mother church, there is no salvation. Now, once you understand how the mother operates, it's easy to spot the daughters. The daughters say the same thing. This is a cultic mindset, folks. So Roman Catholicism clearly admits the mystery of the mixture, or the blending of paganism with Christianity. Quote, Christian ritual developed when, in the 3rd century, the church left the catacombs. Now, remember that the early... Um, fledgling church met in caves and homes to avoid persecution by pagan Rome and so with the legalization you have people leaving the catacombs and and then now you have the legalization of Christianity which was a blending of paganism and Christianity so it says continuing to quote many forms of self-expression must needs be identical in varying times place cults as long as human nature is the same Water, oil, light, incense, singing, procession, prostration, decoration of altars. We're going to get into altars. Vestments of priests. Yes, vestments. That's the garment of the priests. Are naturally at the service of the universal religious instinct. Now we're talking about a universal religious instinct, which means a, re a universal religion. Little enough, however, was directly borrowed by the church, nothing without being baptized, as was the Pantheon. If you've ever been to Rome, there's this Pantheon. It's a beautiful temple, but it was a pagan temple. And then it was, it was uh, baptized, and now it's a Christian temple. All right, that's what it does. And all these things, the spirit is the essential. The church assimilates to herself what she takes, or if she cannot adopt, she rejects. Even pagan, even pagan feasts may be baptized. Certainly our processions of April 25th are the Rabagalia, uh, which Rabagalia is an ancient Roman religion. It was a festival held April 25th. The Rogation Days, which is the beginnings of the major Rogation, can be traced to the Roman holiday of Rabagalia. All right, at which a dog was sacrificed to propitiate or to atone for uh, propitiate, propitiate Rabagas, the god of agricultural disease. So it's a sacrifice in commemoration of a pagan god. May replace the Am Barulia. The date of Christmas Day may be due to the same instinct which placed on December 25th, the Natalis Invicti. All right, so we're talking about December 25th is the Natalis Invicti, which means Sol Invictus, Solus Sun, and Invictus means invincible, the invincible sun. Unconquered sun was the official sun god of the later Roman Empire of the solar cult. But there is little of this. Our wonder is that there is not far more. End quote. That's taken from Catholic Online, Catholic.org, Catholic Encyclopedia, Paganism, Section 3, Art and Ritual. They're saying, hey, we admit that there's paganism, but you know what? There's far little. We are actually surprised that there isn't far more. All right. So that you understand what you borrow from. December 25th is a pagan holiday that was Christianized. All right. So we see that Christian ritualism developed when a part of the fledgling church left the catacombs and became mixed with paganism via Constantine the Great. Yes, Constantine the Great. Paganism being... 
the, quote, universal religious instinct common to the world and being baptized into Christianity created a mixture religious system. The Catholic Encyclopedia not only admits this adulteration or mixture, but states that they are surprised that there was not far more mixture that could have transpired. Okay, quote, Moreover, the origin of the Christian rites is historically certain from our documents. Christian baptism, essentially unique, is alien to the repeated dippings of the initianti, the sacred fish of Artergatus. So the dippings of the initianti, that's the dipping of infant baptism, is about being dipped into or the sprinkling of the, the, the infant is into the initiation into the mystery religion is what it is. Infant, in, infant sprinkling is not in the Bible, okay? And people modify it. You have infant baptism, but it's still not, that's, it, that's infant baptism. Infant baptism is not biblical Christianity. It's Roman Christianity. So you see that the sacred fish of Atergatis, now Atergatis is the chief goddess of northern Assyrian classical antiquity, have nothing to do with the origin of the Eucharist, nor even probably with the ichthys anagram, a symbol consisting of two intersecting arcs, the ends of the right side extending beyond the meeting point so as to resemble the profile of a fish. All right, so these, these are not, uh, so what you have is you have two circles coming together and then they form the Vesica Pisces. This is the uh, sacred fish of Atergatis. All right, so you see this, the, uh, the propagation of the symbol was often facilitated owing to the popular Syrian fish cult. So it's actually a pagan symbol, folks. It's not a Christian symbol. Even though Christians adopted it, it goes back into antiquity, Greco-Roman paganism, and it is a pagan symbol. That the terminology of the mysteries was largely transported into Christian use is certain. That liturgy, especially of baptism, that's infant baptism, organization of the catechumenate, discipline arcani were affected by them is highly probable. Always the church has forcefully molded words and even concepts to suit her own dogma and its expression, end quote. And that's taken from Catholic Online, Catholic.org, Catholic Encyclopedia, Paganism, Section 4, Morality, Assessus, and Mysticism. All right, so it's clearly admitting that they blend paganism with Christianity of fact. All right. So the church borrows from paganism and then baptizes these rites and rituals into Christian rites or ceremonies. That's why I call it Roman Christianity. You're putting something in front of Christ. It's like you have Judaeus, Judaism, Christianity, Roman Christianity, pagan Christianity. Okay, A equals B equals C, therefore A equals C. All right, so we see here that, quote, Greeks, Romans, many other pagans used the fish symbol before Christians. In pagan beliefs, Ichthys was the offspring of the ancient sea goddess Atergatis, and was known in many various mystic systems as Tergata, Aphrodite, uh, Pel Pelagia, or Delphine. Now the word also meant womb and dolphin in some tongues. Before Christianity adopted the fish symbol, it was known by pagans as the great mother and womb. It's linked to fertility, birth, and the natural forces of women was acknowledged also by the Celts as well as pagan cultures throughout Northern Europe. Now remember, the um, mother goddess worship is universal, okay? It's known to all the ancient uh, civilizations. And what it is, is those two circles coming together, forming the Vesca Pisces. What that really is, is the symbolic of the mother goddess, and it is the woman's vulva. That's what it is, okay? And I know that's shocking. Now, Christians use it. Now, you have it, you have it arcing here like this, but it is representing the vulva of the female, okay? Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk you through it. We're going to go through a lot of information. This is history, okay? But it's, that's why it's known as the womb, uh, the Vesca Pisces. And we'll see that even in Washington, D.C. We'll see the Vesica Pisces, okay? And it's going to be well, linked with the obelisk or the phallic symbol, okay? It's representing the male anatomy. All right, so, so before Christianity adopted the fish symbol, it was known by the pagans as the great mother and womb. It's linked to fertility, yes, fertility through sex, all right? 
birth in the natural force of women as uh, was acknowledged also by the Celts as well as pagan cultures throughout Northern Europe. In certain non-Christian beliefs, the fish also has been identified with reincarnation and life force. That's end quote taken from Wikipedia, wikipedia.org under ix, ix this. All right, quote, the Vesica Pisces is a shape that is the intersection of two circles with the same radius intersecting in such a way that the center of each disc lies on the perimeter of the other. The name literally means the bladder of the fish in Latin. The shape is also called the mandorla, which it, uh, means almond in Latin. So you're also going to see the mandorla, two circles coming together, and you're going to see this, and it's going to be looking like a radiate, radiating like a sun, and what you'll see is inside that could be uh, Mary, or inside that could be the Jesus. Jesus coming out of the womb of Mary, a womb of Isis, okay? All right, so continuing forth, we see that Mandorla is also called the Areoli. Uh, I believe that's correct pronunciation. Quote, an Areola, or an Areoli, diminutive of the Latin aura, golden, is the radiance of luminous cloud, which in paintings of sacred personages surrounds the whole figure. Now that can be around the head where you have the nimbus around, which is showing that that is a God figure, or around the whole body. The whole body is, is in the shape of the Vesca Pisces, is representing the womb, the vulva of the mother goddess. And out of that comes the pagan Messiah. So you have Isis, the womb of Isis, and out comes, you have Horus. All right, so we see here, in the earliest periods of Christian art, it was confined to the figures of the persons of the Christian Godhead. But it was afterwards extended to the Virgin Mary and to several of the saints. The areola, when enveloping the whole body, generally appears oval or elliptical in form, but occasionally depicted as circular. So that's talking about the mandorla, or the aureola is the Vesca Pisces, or the quatrefoil. When it appears merely as a luminous disc round the head, it is called specifically a halo or nimbus. While the combination of nimbus and aureoli is called a glory. End quote. Now it's taken from uh, Wikipedia, aureola. And I wish you could see these pictures, folks, and that's why we have, we're creating a Bible study, where it's what you're drawing from, so you can see all these pictures, these visual aids. So we see here, there's a picture here of a Jesus, and he's in the middle of a, uh, of a Vesca Pisces, or a Mandorla, and uh, it's, this is a medieval illuminated manuscript. So we see the Ichthys, the Vesica Pisces, or Pisces, or the Mandorla, represents in paganism, which was baptized into Christianity, the womb or vagina of the mother goddess. Out of the womb of Isis came forth the pagan messiah, Isis. And that's where you have the, uh, when you're dealing with Roman Catholicism, like today, currently, you have the Pope, right? Now, this Pope, and a lot of people don't really uh, take much significance to this, but he is the, um, the Je he's a Jesuit Pope. And so the Jesuit symbol is IHS, which really stands for Isis, Horus, and Set, and it's Egyptian paganism, okay? And that's why they transported from Heliopolis, representing the center of sun worship, the obelisk, which is a phallic symbol representing the man's penis. Yes, this is adult conversation. But notice that was transported to Rome, and that has formed the architecture. And you find that obelisk, the largest obelisk in the world, is in Washington, D.C. And guess what? It's right in the center of the Vesica Pisces. Right in the center, folks, you will see in Washington, D.C., which is the goddess, the, uh, Washington, D.C. is the goddess of the district, the district of the goddess of Columbia, which is mother goddess. It's referring to a mother goddess worship. You have a mother goddess on top of Capitoline Building, which is one of, named after Capitol Building, which is named after one of the hills of Capitoline in Rome. All right. So you have two circles coming together and forming the Vesca Pisces or the vulva, and then you have the, the Washington Monument in the center representing the union between the male and the female. It's a sex symbol. All right, so 
We see here um, Washington Monument, Washington, D.C., District of the Goddess of Columbia. I get ahead of myself. Notice the obelisk or phallus in the center of the Vesca Pisces representing the union of male and female. You can look this up. Uh, do Bing images. Look this up on the Internet. It's fascinating. Quote, Thus it was that the Logos, which is Jesus, in theory, in personal, imminent, blindly evolving in the world, became transfigured on the one hand by pagan myth, and by too close contact on the other with the angel of Yahweh and the ideals of Alexandrian, once again we have Alexandrian Gnosticism, uh, transported from there from the Essenes, so we have the, the ideals of the Alexandrian sapiential or wisdom literature so near to personification that John could take the expression, mold it to his own dogma, cut short all perilous speculation among Christians, and assert once and for all that the Word was made flesh and was Jesus Christ. Yet made of the early apologists were to make great trouble with their use of Platonic formula and with Logos, end quote. And that's taken from Catholic Online, Catholic.org, Catholic Encyclopedia, Paganism, Section 5, Religious Philosophy. So they're really admitting here that Alexandrianism, Alexandrian wisdom, Greek paganism, Platonic formula, is a mixing of paganism together. And yeah, you got this Jesus, but he could be, you know, you're drawing from, you know, just Jesus as comes from a pagan source. Very dangerous, folks. And you go, I don't believe that. Well, do you're borrowing, when you borrow from Roman Christianity, you're yoking yourself to it. Continuing the quote, but into Neo-Platoism, Platonicism, Plato, Greek paganism, all right? Colored with Persian, Jewish, and even Christian language, Judaism, and even Christian language, that's phraseology, the movements passed already in the Isis and Osiris of Plutarch, a pure mysticism, and sub sublimity, sublimity of emotion barely to be surpassed have been achieved in the metamorphosis of uh, Apollusius, the synchronistic cult of the Egyptian goddess, yes, the Egyptian goddess Isis, expresses itself in terms of tenderness and majesty that would fit the highest worship and in concluding prayer of the Apollon, Apollu, Apollon Hermes an ecstatic adoration of God is manifested in language and thought nearly equal still less surpassed save in the inspired writings of the church, but all these efforts of pagan religious philosophy. Yes, it's all complex pagan religious philosophy committed nearly always to a rigid dualism, entangled accordingly in mechanical and magic practices. Yes, magic tricked out in false mythology, risking and losing physical balance by the use of a nihil nihilist asceticism, that's monk, of sense and thought, died in the miserable systems of Gnosticism, Manichaeism, and later Neoplatonicism, and the current true life, and redirected by Paul and John, passed into the writings of Augustine. Now listen to what, end quote, that's taken from Catholic Online, Catholic.org, Catholic Encyclopedia under Paganism, Section 5, Religious Philosophy. So what they're saying is, yeah, you got all this paganism, you have this esoteric paganism, exoteric paganism, and it died in the cults of Gnosticism, Manichaeanism, Valentinianism, um, but it was redirected by Paul and John into the writings of Augustine, the great Catholic Augustine. So they're redirecting it. It's just paganism, but it's brought into, and that's, you know, basically what that's saying is that Christianity has its roots in paganism. And that's what pagans believe. Very dangerous. So the Catholic Encyclopedia clearly admits the fusion of paganism into the Roman Catholic Church. That's a fact, folks. They admit it themselves. You can verify this. They state that Paul and John redirected the paganism into Christianity, which, of course, is false. This religious institution does not believe in the infallibility of the scriptures, and therefore this source has, been, has become clouded in Neoplatonic, which is Greek paganism, philosophy, Alexander Gnosticism, and Jewish mysticism, which all come from Babylon, the source of the mystery religious system. 
The evidence is clear. Roman Catholicism is a mixture of paganism and Christianity. This is irrefutable. And the question remains is, why would anyone want to borrow dogma or doctrine from this untrustworthy source? The answer is simple. Deception. What does God have to say about mixing the heathen customs with the worship of God? Very good question. The mystery of the mystery of the mixture. The Ten Commandments found in Exodus chapter 20 directly state a purity of worship commanded by God. So that's going to be our first reading is Exodus 20. Now we see that worship commanded by God distinct and separate apart from the gods and goddesses of the world. All right, my brother Stephen is going to read Exodus 20, 3, 4, and 5. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Amen. So God does not, is not happy with the blending of paganism and Christianity. So we're going to see the New Testament. Um, you know, a lot of times people go, I want to be a fully devoted follower of Christ, or I want to follow Jesus, you know. Well, how do you do that? You do that by what we just read, not partaking in paganism mixed with Christianity, by being a Bible-believing Christian versus a Roman Christian. So the next reading in the New Testament is um, going to be from Matthew 22, 37 to 40. And that really sums up the Bible in its entirety. It really does. Okay, my brother Stephen is going to read Matthew 22, 37 to 40. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Now it's referring to law and the prophets. The law and the prophets is referring to the Old Testament. So all of this stuff, if you want to simplify uh, Christianity in a nutshell, that's it right there, is getting back to the basics. Now the Law of the Prophets is referring to the Old Testament. I always get ahead of myself. Notice that Jesus Christ wants believers to love Him with all their heart, soul, and mind. And I believe that's done in the right order. So you have to get your heart right because your heart is desperately wicked. And people get deceived all the time. Everybody's been deceived. I've been deceived. I can't count how many times I've been deceived. You get your heart right. Then your soul gets right. And then your mind gets right. So there's a lot of people. So that's important to understand. Now, uh, Exodus. Uh, so we see that in the Old Testament. All right. So I got ahead of myself again. This is uh, partaking or participating in this mixture is not loving God or Jesus Christ with all your heart. What examples in the Bible is there of mixture? In the Old Testament, Israel repeatedly fell into the worship of pagan deities or apostasy against God. That's rebellion against God. Exodus chapter 32 describes an incident in which Israel worshipped the golden calf. Verse 5 states that Israel claimed that this was a feast to the Lord. We're worshipping God and making a, a molten image, a calf. So this is worshiping God, but also worshiping Lucifer. You have to understand that. And they say, oh, it's a feast to God. It's a feast to Jehovah. So they practice rites and rituals in the form of a ceremony. That's important to remember. A ceremony, a liturgy, in which they made themselves naked. This ceremony was borrowed from Egypt, which in turn received its paganism from Babylon. Notice that Israel claimed this apostasy as a feast to God, but in actuality, it was pagan to the core. This was a mixture of heathenistic ritualism with the worship of the one true God, Jesus Christ. Did God approve of such mixture? Worship? Did he say, yeah, that's awesome. Oh, I love when you mix pagan customs and heathenism together. Did God say that? No, he didn't. The answer is no. 
3,000 fell by the sword in response to such apostasy or rebellion against God. Verse 28, if God did not approve of such mixture in times past, then why would he approve of such mixture today between paganism and Christianity? A very good question. A very good question. During the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, the children of Israel carried the tabernacle of God. They were strong believers in the one true God, as we, as we all know. However, some of them were not content with this, so they added something. They made unto themselves a Babylonian tabernacle that they carried with them also, and they said, and the Lord said, this is going to be Amos 5.26. I'm going to have my brother, and next reading is going to be Acts 7.43, and I think there's a direct correlation there. And so they carried a Babylonian tabernacle, and the Lord said, Verse 26 of Amos 5 says, But ye have borne the tabernacle of Moloch, Moloch, child devourer, and Chion, your image is the star of your God, the star of your God which ye made to yourself. Now we have a star of the God of Satan. Now their next reading is going to be Acts 7, 43. <coughs> Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Molech and the star of your god, Repham, and figures which ye made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Now what I believe that star is, is the, um, the six-pointed star. You say it's a star of David. That's not the star of David. That is the star of Molech. That is the star of Chion. That is the star of the god Rephaim. That is the star of Lucifer. And so it, it is actually a 666 symbol. It has six points, okay? It has six, six triangles. And then inside, it is a hexagram, which is six. So it's 666. Now, once again, folks, we're running out of time. All right, but this is the apostasy. This is carrying forward. This is putting paganism in front of Christianity. This is what Israel did in times past as it does today. So love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Until next time, God bless you. Thank you.